Open up to a chapter you've never opened in your life, I'm sure. It's uh, Hebrews 11. I just couldn't get this verse out of my uh, spirit today. And, you know, it's one thing to... Be- <clears throat> it's one thing to believe God uh, for anything, you know. Living by faith, have any of you figured out yet it's not the easiest path? <laughs> okay. Living by faith and not by sight. Learning to trust God. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't easy for anybody. I think about Abraham in the Old Covenant. Again, I'm just astounded at the man's faith, you know. Archaeologists have uh, discovered where he lived now. They, they've, they found Ur of the Chaldees, and they've done archaeology digs there, and they found the house of Abraham where his parents lived and everything. And he was from a well-to-do family. He was probably going to be a lawyer or a, some, you know, a politician or something. Uh, and here God comes and says, okay, I just want you to leave. Leave everything you know, your family, all your prospects. Some of you from the far reaches of the Northwest can relate to what I'm saying. Leave everything you know, friends, family, prospects, and go into a land that I shall show you. And that's really about all God said to him. He didn't say much, you know, like what's the land going to be like when I get there? Uh, God didn't tell him that. How would I know when I get there? Well, God says, I'll show you. <laughs> and so then when he finally gets to this wonderful land, <clears throat> when he gets there, he finds out it's in famine. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Thank you, God. Again, some from that have moved here can relate. <laughs> Because right now, if you're moved by what you see here, it looks like we're in the land of famine. Well, this is not the first time this has happened with God. God's not nervous about this, and we shouldn't be either. And really, it's in the chapter that we have here about faith and all of the heroes of faith, going all the way back to Noah and Abraham and Moses and all of them. Everybody had to learn to live by faith and not by sight. And there's a verse I want to start off with, and then we'll expound on it some. <clears throat> but it's Hebrews 11, verse 6. And this is especially appropriate to us right now. It was appropriate to these first century uh, Jewish Christians, these converts from Judaism, where they were trying to keep the law. Their righteousness was based on their ability to keep the law. And then here comes somebody, a, a fiery evangelist preacher, and preaches a Christ and him crucified, and they get saved. But then, and some of you again can relate to this, all hell come against them. <laughs> all manner of persecution, everything in the world you can think of by man and circumstances. Trying to get them, and, and just think if you were the devil, this first century bunch, how important was it to knock them out? If he could knock them out, then generations would be affected in every family every family where he could remove the gospel from them, their children and their children. It was vitally important. The war was really on in this first century. And see how I think about that when I relate this to where we are right now. We are in the beginning, whether it looks to you like it to you or not, we are in the beginning of a revival like the world has not seen since the book of Acts. It is going to affect generations. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to be till the Lord comes back. Uh, you know, the older I get, the sooner I think it needs to be. <laughs> Cole is not so sure he wants it to be that quick, my grandson. But in any event, I do know that it's very similar. It is so important for us to hold fast to our confession. And so many of the exhortations that I see here to these first century Hebrews, it was vitally important that they not repent, that they, well, what I mean is that they not recant and turn away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and go back under the law generations would be affected by their, their stance. So, of course, the devil threw everything. All manner of persecution was coming against them. And some of their friends, no doubt, I mean, probably a whole bunch of them got saved, and here comes the trouble. And then, no doubt, some of their friends probably did do that because the persecution got so tough, and they're going, hey, I was better off before this old Jesus deal. Hey, I, now, whether you're going to, you don't have, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but you know, there's a thought that comes every now and then. Gee, I seem to be better off before I ever heard of this Dave Roberson guy. <laughs> you know, before I ever heard of this message, you know. Well, so were in the natural, so were they. Persecution came. 
Just exactly what Jesus said would happen in Mark chapter 4. Persecution and affliction for the word's sake. It's not, yes, well, of course the devil does hate you. But it's not coming because he hates you. It's coming because of the word that you have. See, Paul said, and he said, because of the abundance of his revelations. That's why he was assigned a special messenger, a specific demon from hell. Probably the prince next to Lucifer himself. A specific demon assigned to Paul. Shipwrecks, storms, uh, riots, everything. He says danger of thieves, danger of perils of brethren, even, you know, everything in the world come against him. What was the purpose? To stop him, to get him to quit what he was doing. Because everywhere Paul would go, churches would be born, people would be saved, miracles would happen. And he was the most dangerous man in his generation on planet Earth, and he had to be stopped. Well, looking around, you know, I look, you know, we all think of ourselves not more highly than we ought to think. You know, we're not many noble, not many mighty. I don't see the governor here. I don't see the mayor now. Maybe in, anyway. But same thing. God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Give yourself a hand. You're <laughs> I'm one of those foolish things. We're just foolish enough to believe him. But see, right in the midst of the persecution here of these, he these first century Hebrews, and it plainly says they, well, here, well, I, I guess I should read the verse, okay? <laughs> Let's read. The, did I ever read the verse? I didn't read it. Okay, Hebrews 11.6 is the one. Right in the middle of your persecution, you have to remember this. And every person that ever believed God. That's why he starts listing Noah and Abraham. Every person that has ever stood their ground on the word of God and believed the promises. They had to believe the same thing. And here it is, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he, he that comes to God must believe, and it's two things, must believe that he is, first off. He is what? Well, what does God say about himself? I told Moses. Moses says, well, who will I say sent me when I go to Pharaoh? Who will I say sent me? You tell him, I am that I am has sent you. Well, that's step one. You've got to believe that God is who he says he is. You've also got to believe the counter of that. You've got to believe you are who God says you are. Not what you see about yourself. But what God says, who God says you are. So he that comes to God must believe that he is, and there's so much that goes with that. He is what? He is God. He is immovable. He is unchangeable. He is the God who cannot lie. His word cannot be changed. His word will not change for you. you we, the good news is we can change and believe his word. See? But you must believe that he is. But here's the second part. And... That he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Not just seek him, but diligently seek him. And then he starts listing all of these heroes of faith from the Old Testament. Now, and actually, we have a, we're in a better covenant established on better promises. None of these are really our pattern. Jesus is our pattern. But you, did you know he too? He too had to believe that God was a rewarder? I mean, if nobody has suffered like Jesus suffered. Noah suffered persecution. Abraham suffered persecution. Moses suffered persecution. David, you could go down. All of them suffered resistance, if you'll call it that. All of them did. But none of them suffered to the extent of Jesus. To even not only suffer in his body on the cross, but to suffer the the, he bore our sicknesses and carried our pains in his own body. The, the penalty that he paid for our sins. Yet he died in faith believing. He is the, he is the ultimate pattern for us to look at. So with, look at verse 6 again. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is, he, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I don't know if you ever do this. When I meditate about Jesus on the cross. But he had had to hurt. He was not immune to pain. He had a body like we had. Let's not even talk about the sicknesses. Just the scourging that he took. Michael Muccio, the, the 
man that led me to the Lord. In those days, when he, uh, 32 years ago, when he was leading a whole group of us to the Lord, every now and then we'd, we'd wind up at his apartment, and he had a painting there that I wish I had. I've looked for it since, and I've never found, a, found it anywhere. But it was a painting of a mass of blood and bone hanging on a cross, and it was Jesus. And did you know that's scriptural? Because it says his visage was marred, his image was marred more than any man. He didn't even look like a man. It was so bad for a while. I think the worst of that must have been while he was, that three hours of darkness, when you couldn't really see when he was actually experiencing in his body every sickness and every pain. He became so contorted, didn't even look like a man anymore. And I've, I've thought about what was in his mind. Was he still believing? Hebrews eleven six as he's suffering the agony on that cross. You know what I think he was seeing? He was seeing Gary Carpenter. He was seeing Daisy Black. He was seeing you down through the centuries. And he said, through this offering, not only are they going to become acceptable to God, but I am going to free them from sin itself. There will be a people who, is, who will be able to rise above sin. They will no longer be slaves to sin. Not only are they going to be declared righteous with my righteousness, they'll be empowered with my life. God, right there now, it makes me want to start jumping. That's who we really are. And yeah, he, he had, it says, for the joy, come on down to chapter 12 for a minute. It says, for the joy set before him. That's chapter, uh, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, you are that joy. And not only you, but the pleasure that it would bring to the Father. Mark was so right. God so, it's not that God was angry with Adam, although I'm sure he was, I mean, any father is disappointed when their son messes up, you know. But the first thing that the father did was provide a way of escape for Adam with the sacrifice of those animals. God's down through the centuries, immediately this plan went into action to get his beloved children back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That world right there is before the cross. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us still. And for the joy set before Jesus, I can't imagine, really. I've seen the, uh, uh, that movie, uh, thank you, my mind, The Passion of the Christ. They did a pretty good job in that, you know. I mean, they, it's pretty brutal, and it was probably, probably even worse than that. But I, I was thinking, of what was in his mind? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And today he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now here's the thing. He was with God in the beginning before all of that. <laughs> he, was with, he was the word always. He was, he's always been. He's, he, he says in John chapter 17, he says, Now restore me to the glory that I had with thee before the world was. He didn't do this for himself. Everything he did was for us. That's the faith that we have to have. Now let's back up again into Hebrews 11. Let's back up actually into chapter 10 for just a minute. Because when I think about their affliction and how, it, how important it was during that first century that they hold fast. Dear God, was it important. Every, their family, these, the, every one of these young men and women, they grew up to have families. And they would pass the gospel to their children. Who would pass the gospel to their children. If there was ever a generation that it was important and I know the devil knew that too, so he was throwing the book at them like he's been throwing the book at us. And so you can see here in verse 32 what they were going through, some of it. Chapter, Hebrews 10, 32. It says, call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, that means after they were born again, you endured a great fight of afflictions. I could rewrite that verse and I'd say, call to remembrance the former days. After you first made that decision that you were going to contend for revival by doing this message, 
You endured a great fight of afflictions. Can I get any witnesses here? So, yeah, there. Okay, getting some witnesses. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions. Any of your relatives think you're crazy? Any of your friends wonder why in the world are you here? Why are you going here? Why don't you go down to the first church? Or the fourth, fifth church, whatever that one was I saw that time. Fifth, fourth church, whatever it was. <laughs> you know, where you know, where everything's nice and you know, the biggest church in the land, the message every week is your best life now. Whether they call it that or not. It's all about and I and there's a place for that. I'm not, you know, God does want us to be blessed and be happy and be fruitful. There's a place for that. But see, if that's, if that's all there is to life, please, just kill me now. I don't want to have my best life now and leave Tommy Perez in a wheelchair until he dies. For benefit of you that don't know who that is, Tommy Perez is a man in his 30s now, born with cerebral palsy, son of a really good friend, two friends of ours. I have prayed. Dave has prayed. Uh, Bronk has prayed. Everybody that we know of to take up there has. We have prayed with all the faith that we know how, and we cannot get him out of the chair so far. But I know, and you know, if Jesus could walk up somehow, if Jesus could walk up, lay his hand on Tommy Perez, he's out of that wheelchair in a heartbeat. Now, I can't live my best life now, just going through life with the best houses, the best cars, the best clothes, the best everything. I'm not against that, but please, I don't want that instead of revival. If that comes along with revival, great. And if it doesn't, we'll talk about all that stuff in the new heaven and the new earth. And my life is just not about that anymore, and it's not ever going to be. We've got them right here in our church. Mar Marvinus isn't here tonight, but her and Malcolm... They're a child born to them without a fully developed brain. Victoria, good name, Victorious. Well, there's a creative miracle. Medical science has nothing they can offer for Victoria, nothing at all. Medical science, they, how many of you have heard of any brain transplants? <laughs> they can do lungs, hearts, all kinds of stuff, but there is no brain transplant. Okay? How many of you think Jesus would help her? Absolutely, and he will do that through us if we can ever get to revival. So here we've got a group in our generation contending for something in my mind, just as, and here we've got a, I, I probably can't say on video that, no, I can't say it that way. Here we've got a country in trouble, the USA. In my mind, it is in trouble and getting in more trouble year by year. The only hope is revival, real revival, the kind that changes hearts where mothers don't want to kill their babies anymore. The kind that changes hearts where people say, what God says is sin, that is sin. The, where we, we don't try and legislate the morals. It changes the hearts of the people where they have the morals of God on the inside. <clears throat> That's what we've got to have. Well, we are just as dangerous, in my mind, contending for a revival like that as these first century cre Jewish Christians were. He has to stop us. He has to stop Pastor Dave before Dave makes it into this love of God far enough to where that kind of revival happens on a regular basis. He's got to be stopped if he can. You've got to be stopped because you haven't been run off yet. What's wrong with you people? You, you, you like trouble, do you? Well, it's not that you like trouble. But if trouble comes while well, you're contending for that which he bought, you know, I don't know about you. I, where, are we, where are we going to go? Where are you going to go back? You going to go back and have them put you back under the law with your giving? Go back to telling you you're just an old sinner saved by grace? And it's okay. You know, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's all passed away now. You don't need to pray. You don't need to fast. You don't need to do anything. Well, oh, give me a break. It's too late for you. You're spoiled. <laughs> In a... In a wonderful way. You're ruined. You're just no good to the, to the devil or religion at all. <laughs> You've seen life and you must have more. See. Well. Verse 33 we read there. Partly while you were made a gazing stock. Both by reproaches and afflictions. And partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds. And took joyfully... <laughs> 
the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Most people pride themselves in how new their car is, you know. Here at the prayer center, we pride ourselves in how many miles we're on our car, and it's still running. <laughs> you look at the parking lot, it's not full of limos or, you know, big fancy cars, but bless God, they run. Now, in heaven, there's a twofold meaning here. You have a, a more enduring substance. Did you know that God is still the owner of all things? If you needed it, God would give you a, a different car for every day of the week if you needed it, if there was really a gospel reason for it. Somebody asked one time, said, well, could a preacher ask for a freight train and God give it to him? I said, well, if God had a reason for that, he would. Gave Lester Summerall a ship during his lifetime. Lester used that ship to feed the nation and pre nations and preach the gospel. He didn't use it for sunny yachts and, you know, sunny yacht trips to wherever, you know. Time out. I'll share a treasure with you. My 91-year-old mother was watching an old video on TV the other day of Lester Summerall. And she knows that I like him, Lester, a lot, you know. So she was watching this, and Lester was sharing. You know, that old gruff voice of his, you know. And he was sharing a secret. He said, I'm about to give you the wisdom of the ages. If you can just get a hold of this one thing. You'll live a life worth living, and you'll please God and enter into heaven. He built it up for a long time, a lot more than I'm doing now. You know, you're almost sitting on the edge of your chair waiting for this revelation. Then he shouts at the camera, don't sin. <laughs> and the thing of it is, in, you, in a new creation reality, you don't have to. Most of the church won't preach that, I'm telling you. Anyway, back to this. So verse 35, and here's where we are. See, this goes right along with, if you don't have verse 6, Hebrews eleven six. 6, if you don't really still believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, you know what God rewards them with? If you go back and look at that, he rewarded them with the manifestation of his word. The flood came, and Noah's family survived. Abraham, sure enough. A miracle happened in their bodies, and Isaac was born in the generations. And today, he is the father of many nations. His, his spiritual children number like the stars of heaven. Think of all the generations. Every one of them received the manifestation of what God said. That's the reward. So look here at verse 35. He says, Cast, yes, sir. You know what our reward is? The manifestation of everything that we say. On these, on these pages. And more. This is just like the starting point. A thousand people born again every week at the prayer center. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them. No exceptions. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. On and on and on. We're going to have what he has said we, we're going to have. But in order for that to happen, you have to do th verse 35 of chapter 10. Which is cast not away, therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. When this revival is raging and people are getting saved by the thousands and people are getting healed by the thousands on a daily basis. Muslims are coming to Jesus in droves. Hindus are coming to Jesus in by the thousands and all, and, and we had the media so it can be going on around the world and have a, a worldwide harvesting combine. You think you're not going to be a happy camper that you stayed in there and contended for this word that you did not cast away your confidence. Cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now, one of my daughters said, patience is highly overrated. <laughs> Y'all should have laughed right there. But, <laughs> but we have need of patience. And this patience here is really the better word is endurance. 
It's exactly the same word that today we would transfer in the, we would translate in the English language, endurance. Well, endurance is the first word that the Holy Spirit ever spoke. It's, it's printed and out there in the foyer. It's, endurance is the key. Here it says you, you have need of patience. You have need of endurance. You've got to withstand all of this that's going on, not be moved by what you see. He's going to get to that in just a little bit. But he says you have need of patience that after you've done the will of God. Well, in our case, what does that mean? Doing the message. Continuing. No matter the persecution, no matter, I don't care if it gets down where it's like five of us. I don't care. We, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, I don't care if we wind up in a, in a tent out in the grass. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. We're going to continue till we have the manifestation of what he has said to us. We have need of endurance, that kind of endurance. <clears throat> Noah endured for a hundred years. If I endure for a hundred years, I'm going to be a good looking fellow. <laughs> Abraham, it was over, what, 25 years, right at 25 years until that promise was manifested. I did a study one time on Joseph, you know, it, uh, he was the one that wound up in the, the guy with the coat of many colors and he wound up in prison, but eventually God used him to, to deliver it, to save the whole nation of, of Israel from uh, that famine that would have wiped them out. And, and also trying to save the, the Egyptians. And I did a study one time. From the day that he had that vision until the day it really happened was 22 years. 22 years. You have need of endurance. Need of endurance. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now here's, here's our... Here was their mandate, and here's our mandate. Now, it was really more serious for them because the temptation for them was to turn away from Jesus altogether, reject him as the Son of God. For us, most of the people here is not under that temptation. The temptation here is, can I please get away from the bullseye? And they've got a, got a lot of help from a thousand devils every week. There's something wrong with these places. You need to get away from here. Look at this. It's not going better. It's getting worse, you know. Get a lot of help from a lot of devils. Talk, you know, putting thoughts in your mind to, to leave. But it says, now the just shall live by faith. What does that mean? Well, you've got to live based on what God has said. More specific, that means what he has said in his written word. But... If you'll look, every single one of these people that, that he's about to give examples here, they each received a word from God. It's not just faith in his written word to the, everybody. It's faith in his word to you. It's the just shall live by faith. Faith in what? What has he said to you? In my, as a, just a time out, as a little personal example, in mine and Sue's case, one, just one of the things he said to us was to make all of our materials free right from the beginning. And that was hard to do. And he doesn't tell everybody that. And I don't even, I'm not, you know, it's not wrong to, you know, it's, it's expensive to produce in those days, cassette tapes. Now it's CDs and other things. It costs money to do that. What it really costs money for postage to send all that, it, you know, and, but in our case, so, well, excuse me. So, you know, a lot of people, they sell the material, they sell the materials and trying to get enough money to, to do that and probably some to live on. But in our case, Regardless of all that, see, in my case, all of that is moot. Moot, is that a good word? That means nothing. <laughs> because he said to us, don't sell anything. You give it away all free. I had 10,000 opportunities not to obey that. Every circumstance in the world came against us, and I mean for years, where it looked like I missed God. Just like here. Well, Dave, you know, look around. We're not in revival. Dave must have missed it. He, sure, he must not have heard God on and on. I can, you can just hear the devil talking and talking and talking. Well, with us, same deal. You know, here I'm, I'm preaching our little Bible study on a Thursday night like we've got a million dollars in the bank. And on the in, that's the way I was on the outside. And on the inside, I'm praying, oh, God, don't let them shut the electric off till everybody leaves. I mean, it was bad. And I had all these thoughts of everybody else sells their tapes, you, you know, uh, 
All, look at all these ministries. It's, you know, they're, they're supported in large part by selling tapes. And you must have missed it and not heard God. And you need to sell your tapes. And on and on and on. And I, that's just one of the things. Well, same thing. The just shall live by what? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in what he said to you. You got to believe that he is God. You got to believe that if you'll endure and cast not away your confidence and hold steady to what he told you, that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We did make it past that. Have you noticed I didn't starve? <laughs> the bills are paid. We've lived in a nice house. We never once had to, had to sleep out in the grass, you know. Uh, I had a car to drive, and now I've got two cars to drive, and they're both paid for, thank you very much. And, and we've, we're feeding the nations. And, and now he's made it even more so through the Internet and the MP3s. And, and uh, we did a study. I don't know how, I'm not real good at the statistics, but we did a study one time. Like at this very moment, and while I'm speaking live here, my voice, there's a good chance it's being heard about 70 times around the world. I'm preaching here live, but I'm preaching 70 times around the world, not live, all at the same moment. Don't tell me he doesn't multiply your seed. <laughs> Isn't that good? Isn't that good? See, his word to us has come to pass. I remember when he told us this before we even hardly had anything. We didn't have a website hardly or nothing. And he says, what you teach in the morning, I wanted heard in Zimbabwe that night. Well, that sounded impossible. How in the world are you going to do something like that? We're awfully close to that now, you know. What I taught this morning will be on the internet tonight before midnight. And they should be able to get it in Zimbabwe. Isn't that amazing? You've got to hold fast. That's what it means. Now the just shall live by faith. Now in their case it says if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in them. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Now that, that word normally is translated damnation. It's really talking about hell. It's talk, now in their case... The temptation they were under was different. It was to reject Jesus altogether, that he's not the son of God, that he didn't die for your sin. Just reject him totally and go back to trusting in the law of Moses. Well, in that case, if you do that, there is no other salvation. There is no other savior. This whole letter is about that, not to tread underfoot the blood of Jesus and count his blood as an unholy thing, you know, not to reject him. In our case, it's not a matter of going to hell if you leave. I mean, dear God. <laughs> We're not, we're not preaching that at all. But you will draw back from the war. You can be blessed. You can love God, serve God, not contend for revival. Dear God, I mean, most of the church is doing that. And, and God loves them and is blessing them. And, and they're not the same target that you are. I'd rather be the target. I, besides that, in my case, I don't really have a choice. Well, I do, but I don't. Paul talked about that. He says, you know, he says, I, I'm under a mandate. I don't, I don't really have a choice. This is what God called me to do. And if I choose anything else, yeah, he'll love me, but I'll fail in my, in my, in my commission that I received from the Lord. Well, that's exactly the way I feel. And the fact that you're still here, that's probably the way you feel also. It's not easy. Somebody said recently, it's not easy to live here. <laughs> And a young person that I greatly admire for their faith, you know, it's not easy. I understand that. Especially, you know, when you move away from friends and family and, and leave everything. You guys are so much like Abraham. Uh, you're, you're my heroes. You're, someday there'll be a chapter with you. <laughs> By faith. <laughs> Moved from a wonderful land, anyway. <laughs> now, what we are actually doing on calling in the lost... As we go through these confessions, if you really want to know the truth of it, it's Hebrews 11.1. 1. So let's look at that verse. <clears throat> this is really the definition of what faith is. Faith, it's the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's always the case. God's word always operates like that. Faith believes what God says and accepts it as being true, whether you see the results of it or not. The opposite of that is living by sight. Well, I'll believe it if my senses agree with it. Well, that's, that's living by sight. That's what, that's what caused Adam to have to leave the garden 
And I'm not going to teach that again tonight. But faith is until you have the manifestation of the thing. Like if you're contending for a healing. Okay? Until you have the manifestation of that. What you have as substance is faith. Well, what gives you that faith? I have God's word. Okay? That would be in general. In mine and Sue's case, when day by day, it seemed to be like this financially. Okay, we didn't die today. Surely we shall die tomorrow. (laughs) By sight, that's what it looked like every day for years. It looked like that. It looked the exact opposite. Yet God has said, I am your, you just read it. I am your provider. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. On and on. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am, you know, the abundant one. I am it just on and on and on. His word says he'll provide for you. But our circumstances, because we were obeying what he told us, was the exact opposite. Well, until the manifestation came, all we had was our faith. We felt like these Hebrews. Uh, Okay, they didn't turn the electricity off today. (laughs) Maybe tomorrow. But in the meantime, we're going to hold fast to what he said. And that thousand thoughts in my head, you need to sell your tapes. You need to get big offerings. You need to teach this. You need to book meetings. You need to do all this stuff. A thousand fix-it things going on in my thoughts in my head. But faith says, hold fast to what God said. Just do what he said. Well, That's what faith is. And you can't mix the two. It's one or the other. You're either living by your circumstances or you're living by faith. Well, the very fact that you're here on a Sunday night, right in the midst of the war, tells me I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> the people that need to hear this aren't here. No, I'm just <laughs> No, but he wanted to encourage you tonight. I wanted to encourage you. This is not the first time. This is normal, standard operating procedure for people that have received a word from God. And are standing for it and contending for it and having patient endurance for it in the midst of it. We still, Hebrews eleven six 6 has to be your watchword. Listen, God is who he says he is. He means exactly what he said to us. And he is a rewarder of us as we continue, continue to diligently seek him. Hallelujah. I think that's really it for tonight. Okay, don't, I want you to, don't be discouraged, be encouraged. You are right in line with every person of faith that has ever lived. You have received a word from God. The circumstances are making it look the exact opposite. Welcome to living by faith. Welcome to living by faith. I believe in heaven the book of Acts is still being written. And there's a chapter in there. By faith, Fred. By, by faith, Kim. Our names are being written in there right now, too. Amen? Amen. So now, as we go through these confessions, these are really, these are the promises that God has made to us. Many of these, as you know, are simply based on the direct word of God. But many of these also are things that the Lord has spoken mainly through Dave, down, or to Dave and then to us, down through the years. Like, The one there, it says a minimum of a thousand people born again every week. I remember when that word came forth. I remember. That's something that the Lord wants here. Um, So what we're really doing here is using the same faith as the faith of Abraham, who also called those things that be not as though they were. We've taken all those promises. We've written them up here like present tense confessions. And this doesn't take very long, about 20, 30 minutes. And for the, we're just going to call those things which be not as though they were. Worth it, it helps keep faith alive. It helps keep that vision strong of what's coming. This is, what, this is what you're contending for. You ready? So just repeat after me. Say, Father, I worship you. I glorify you. And I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away. But your word will never pass away. Therefore I say. Your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. 
The, now listen, when we say this, we're talking about not once every 10 years. When this revival breaks out, this, it, this is what Jesus calls normal church. If we had time tonight, which we don't, we'd go through those five different uh, services that he held in the book of Matthew, where it plainly says five different Holy Ghost, what do you call it, meetings that he had, five different ones where it says he healed them all. Okay? That's normal church. It's not normal to him for the lame and the blind to come and leave lame and blind. Okay? So when we say these things, we mean every time. This is a normal experience where people could bring their blind child from anywhere on planet earth to these meetings and have confidence that when they get that child here, that child is going to see. Or even more with media, if they can get to where a meeting is going on uh, in their town somewhere where somebody has internet connection and a video, that that child can get healed right there. Won't that be a day? Won't that be a harvesting moment? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just start again. Father, I worship you. <laughs> I glorify you. And I praise you. You're not a man that you could lie. You have exalted your word above your name. Heaven and earth will pass away. But your word will never pass away. Therefore I say. Your glory is present at the prayer center. The blind see. The deaf hear. The lame walk. The dead are raised. And the poor they have the gospel preached to them. A minimum of a thousand people are born again at the prayer center every week. We have a minimum of 500 intercessors who are holding up the message that has come to maturity. We are able to get along with each other while the Father works revival in our midst. We have that kind of worship. That takes us beyond the veil of the flesh. In order that we may worship. In spirit and in truth. We worship you Father out of our new nature. We give you family worship as your sons and daughters. Father, at the prayer center, those that come will see a people transformed to the nature of Christ. Father, we say, in the name of Jesus, no person ever leaves the prayer center the same way they came. Every person that comes receives a touch from the good shepherd. Father, those that come who are beaten down, <coughs> discouraged, worn out, and tired, <laughs> they won't leave that way. They'll be encouraged, strong, and mature. They'll leave standing upright, their shoulders squared, their heads held high, going forth as a mighty army, to take this planet for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus. Father, your glory fills every service. Every person that comes drinks of your glory. They'll leave as earthen vessels. Filled with your glory. Filled with your wisdom. Filled with your love. Filled with your grace. And anointed by your spirit. They'll carry your presence with them. They'll carry revival around this world. Father we declare. We preach your gospel. We'll never settle for man's gospel. Only yours. It's the gospel that saves. The gospel that fills. And the gospel that heals. 
That's why we say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Blind, see. Lame, walk. Deaf, hear. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, that's your gospel. We'll settle for nothing less. We're going for the gold. We have what we say. And we say at every service, the lost are saved. People are filled with the Holy Ghost. The blind see. The lame walk. The deaf hear. The maimed are made whole. And even the dead are raised. In the name of Jesus. More than 12 legions of angels are loosed to prepare the way for revival. Angels are dispatched to the four corners of the earth, intercepting and stopping every mission and every assignment of the enemy that would bring circumstances against those who would come. Angels are changing those circumstances by rearranging them, causing money to come, and by changing schedules. We say every person that is to be here will be here in the name of Jesus. There is no devil big enough, no assignment crafty enough, no circumstances bad enough that will keep even one from being here. Father, we declare your house full. Angels are moving back. The forces of darkness over this region. They're opening up a window. A window of light. 25 miles in every direction both horizontally and vertically. There is a fortress of angels surrounding us to keep back the darkness. Father, angels are dispatched now. Softening the hurts were... No, softening the hearts where hurts have wounded, where calluses have formed, where walls of defenses have gone up. Angels are softening the hearts and creating atmospheres where the people can hear the voice of their shepherd. Angels are preparing their hearts now. So they're already receivers when they arrive. From the first word spoken, from the first song sung, from the first prayer prayed to the end of every service, the people are free to receive from your spirit <clears throat> the assignments of all devils against the prayer center, the people of the prayer center, and the leadership of the prayer center. All those assignments are dismissed. In the name of Jesus, I declare those plans null and void. Devil, we're taking Tulsa from you. In fact, we already have. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Not you. We're in authority here. <coughs> Not you. Devil, get out of Tulsa. Take all your demons with you. The king of kings has made a decree. And I am speaking in his stead. The king has declared. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The king has decreed. Captives. You are free. Every person returns. 
to his original inheritance, that is the born again trail. Father, you have restored our inheritance. And at the prayer center, the inheritance is not just known about. We don't just teach about it, but it's received, manifested, and seen. Father, you have restored our fellowship with you. The firstborn told us to pray. Father, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven, as in heaven, so on earth, as in heaven, so in Tulsa. There are no lost people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is saved. There are no sick people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is healed. There are no demoniacs in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is delivered. And there's no poor people in heaven. Therefore, we say, Tulsa is prospered. And Tulsa is blessed. All right, now, especially as we go into this next section here. See it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. See these in your mind, okay? We declare every captive free. Every wheelchair emptied. All of them. No exceptions. Every artificial help. Wheelchairs. Crutches. Canes. Hearing aids. Glasses. Stretchers. Bladder bottles. They may need them when they come. They will not need them when they leave. And we'll have them here as trophies to the glory of Jesus the healer. All manner of sickness and all manner of diseases are healed first time, every time, all of them, no exceptions. Jesus, you healed them all then. You healed them all now. That's what we say. That's what we have in the name of Jesus. Father, there are impartations of your spirit. We declare these are the most powerful, the most anointed, the most life-changing, the most revival-producing, Services in history. Fresh anointings. Fresh giftings like never before. Since the book of Acts. Father, it's you doing the works. Therefore, all things are possible. Now let's talk to our soul like David did. Say, soul, my own soul. I command you. Believe this. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible. And every backslider will come back to God. They'll never leave God again. So now, Father, in preparation, I forgive every person their trespasses against me. Father, forgive me all of my trespasses against you. I am freshly washed in the blood of the Lamb in order that my record in heaven be perfect. Therefore, I say, because of the blood, what Jesus did for me, according to my record in heaven, I have never failed God. I lay down my life that the life of Christ may be manifest in me. I take no offense and I give no offense and according to my record in heaven I never have. At the prayer center 
The mind of Christ is delivered to both the sheep and the shepherds. It is delivered with such simplicity and with such clarity that the wayfaring fool could not misunderstand it. Therefore I say, the people at the prayer center, and especially me, we all understand every word that Pastor Dave teaches. Every, boy, this is a good one. This is, we stood on these uh, words like this during that two years, about three years. Every need is met. <laughs> No matter how large, no matter how small, there are no cases too hard, there are no cases too late, whatever they come for to receive from Jesus, they get it, all of them, first time, every time, no exceptions. I declare every captive free. Free in spirit, free in soul, free in body, all are delivered, all are restored. Father, you are provider. Angels are dispatched to gather in all of the finances and everything that is required. Things we know about now, things we don't even know about yet. Because you are the God who answers before we call. I speak against the strongholds of lack. And I declare an abundance. Abundance. Be in the name of Jesus. Therefore we say. There is no lack. We operate from abundance. We operate from surplus. We have all in a bound with many baskets left over. We have such abundance. We can pay the way for many to come and many to go. We send them out on prosperous journeys for God with abundance in a manner fitting for servants of the Lord. Our financial granaries are full because our king has found stewards he can trust. And I'm one of them. Father, if you need anything, come to my house first. Don't go to Daisy's house first. <laughs> come to my house first. <laughs> Whatever you have need of, come to my house first. All I need to know is my Lord has need of it, and it's yours. I have been bought with a price. My life is not my own. I am a first-class servant. Lord, I lay all my possessions at your feet. I say again, Lord, if you need anything I have, it's yours. I love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. The second commandment is like unto the first. I love my neighbor as myself. I love my good neighbors. I love my bad neighbors. I love my mean neighbors. And I love my enemies. Jesus, you are my Savior. You are my Lord. Whatever you ask, that's what I do. I am your servant. I am your bond slave by my own free will choice. I serve you, Lord, by serving these people that you love so much. Now, you're saying this by faith. You're not lying. I serve the good people. I serve the bad people. I serve the mean people. And I especially serve your enemies. Because you're trying to save them all. 
You'd like to use me to do it. All that I have is yours. My time is yours. My body is yours. My family is yours. I own nothing. I am your bond slave. Use me as you will. You are provider for me, my family, and all that I have. And I am available for your use. We lift up the blood-stained banner over this city. Written in the blood of Jesus, on the banner are these words. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. Tulsa is in revival. Tulsa is in revival. And where Jesus is Lord, the Father's will is done. So, Father, have your way. Not just 30 fold, not just 60 fold, but 100 fold. Again, I say, lost, be saved. Empty, be filled. Captives, go free. Blind, see. Deaf, hear. Lame, walk. Maimed, be whole. Dead, rise again. In the name of Jesus. Father, thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power. Thine is the glory. Forever, your will be done in Tulsa. Just as it is in heaven. As in heaven, so in earth. As in heaven, so in Tulsa. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Tulsa is saved. Now shout about it. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise the name of Jesus. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. Tulsa is in revival. Jesus is Lord over Tulsa. We have what we say in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, many of the faces on this prayer box are the very ones that I was talking about earlier. Here's Tommy. This is Tommy Perez and his mother, Lynn, here. Uh, Victoria is on here. She's on the front, okay? There's Victoria right here. Now, she's quite a bit older than that now. But each one of these pictures here represents an impossible case according to man's, man's standards. Medical science has nothing they can do. No hope at all. How many of you know our God is the God of all hope? There is nothing impossible with him. Now, we've already prayed, so you don't have to repeat after me, but just extend your faith, maybe your hand this direction as a point of contact. Father, we have already lifted up prayer for each and every one of these cases, these impossible cases by the world standard. Father, we have believed that we received when we prayed. Father, that's our part, to believe we receive it at the moment of prayer. Father, we're thanking you now that you heard us. Your word says that if we will believe we received it, that we shall have it. Father, we're thanking you that we shall see the full manifestation of the miracle for every one of these faces. And Father, all of the prayer requests that's in this box, and they keep more coming all the time. Father, I know that there's everything from hangnails to suicide, marriages, drugs, and everything, everything in the world, Father. Father, your word tells us that if we ask anything that's according to your will, we know that you hear us. And that's really all we need to know because our confidence is, if you hear us, then we have the petition that we desire of you. So, Father, we're joining our faith together with all of these that have sent in these prayers. We're thanking you right now for answering every single prayer that Jesus paid the price for them to have. Father, if a stranger sent in a prayer request, someone who's not yet born again, they're not yet in your family, not yet in your kingdom, Lord, if they had enough faith to send a prayer request here, we ask like Solomon asked, 
Answer the prayer of the stranger. Father, do it in such an unusual and unique way that they'll have to know it was you that answered that prayer. Father, so they can know you are the only true and living God. They can hear and believe the gospel of your son and be saved in Jesus' name. Father, we lay our hands now by faith on these prayer cloths. Lord, we know that this is just cloth. There's nothing magical or special about the cloth. But Father, you're the same God today that you were in the book of Acts. When those claws were taken from Paul's body and laid upon the, those that had devils, the devils came out. When they laid on those that were sick, they were healed. Father, we're thanking you now for saturating these claws with the tangible presence and the tangible anointing of your spirit. Father, our faith is, is that that anointing and presence will travel with the cloth. When these claws are laid on the sick, they will recover. When they're laid on people that have devils, the devils will come out. Alcoholics will be delivered. Drug addicts will be delivered. Marriages will be put back together. Wayward children will come to their senses, return to their parents' house. You'll turn the hearts of the parents to the children. And many other special miracles you do in our day. Because you're the same God now that you were in the book of Acts. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up Pastor Dave as he's ministering in Florida. Father, we thank you that during these meetings there's an outpouring of your spirit, an outpouring of revival that surprises even him and Pastor Bronk. We're thanking you for notable miracles being done, that signs and wonders be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus, Father. Father, we, in Dave's ab absence now, we lift up Rosalie and all of the house, Tim and Leah Stemple and all of their house. Father Allen, I believe, is out of state ministering also, so we thank you for an anointing upon him. We thank you for provision for, his, for Christy and, and all, of the, all of their family. Father, for every minister and their families that ministers here, for all of the staff, for all of those that aren't officially on staff, but really for all practical purposes they are. Father, we declare for all of them, no weapon formed against them will prosper. But everything they set their hand to do will prosper in the name of Jesus. Father, we're facing another week. We had the same hours in our week that the president has. We're going to use those hours on something. Father, you have many good, many good churches and many people in this city. Father, some specialize in feeding the hungry. Some specialize in clothing the naked. Some specialize in evangelism. And Father, we're commanded and permitted to be involved in all of those things. But Lord, you've given a specific assignment to this church. And that's to go far enough into you to bring a supernatural revival to a religious city. Father, not only did you give us the mandate, but you've given us the tools and understanding on how to do that. So Father, we need your help. Father, it's so easy for another week to go by. Father, help us not spend too much of our time and too much of our energy even on good things that are not the God thing that you called us to do. Lord, we're going to stand before you one, one, someday. And we're going to give an accounting of the stewardship of our life. Father, at that time, we want to have the same testimony as the Apostle Paul. We fought the good fight. We kept the faith. And we finished the race that you set out in front of us. Father, we are believers that you are who you say you are. And we believe that you are a rewarder of us as we diligently seek you. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Amen.